an American treasure lost. Today we learned Andy Griffith has died all day long. So many remembering that fictional town of Mayberry, that sheriff, and that whistle. When someone passes away, there is a predictable rhythm to the events that follow. Funeral arrangements, condolences, and a somber gathering of loved ones to bid farewell. This age-old ritual, as conventional as it is, sometimes sees exceptions. My life has been a gift, and I do try to, I do try to keep it honest, keep it sharp, keep it interesting. Such was the case for television icon Andy Griffith. His departure from this world was as distinctive as the mark he left upon it. The story behind why Andy Griffith was buried just four hours after his death isn't just surprising. I'll tell you the truth, if a fellow was trying to get himself thrown in a jug, he couldn't do a better job than... It's a poignant testament to a man who meticulously shaped his final act. The cultural norms of death and burial. Death, the inevitable end to every life, carries with it a plethora of customs, rituals, and traditions, varying vastly across cultures, religions, and regions. These practices, deeply rooted in historical, cultural, and religious contexts, are more than just rituals. They provide the living a way to make sense of death, mourn, and celebrate the life that was. In most Western societies, there's a familiar script that follows a death. The body is embalmed, a viewing is held, followed by a funeral service, and eventually burial or cremation. This process usually spans over several days to a few weeks, allowing family and friends to come to terms with their loss, gather, and provide mutual support. The public nature of these events also allows the broader community to pay their respects and express their condolences. In many parts of Asia, for instance, death is seen as a transition rather than an end. Elaborate rituals are performed to ensure a smooth journey for the deceased to the afterlife. Often the body is kept at home for several days, allowing friends and family to visit, pray, and prepare the deceased for the next journey. In traditional Judaism, the customs around death are clear and are adhered to with great reverence. It is customary to bury the deceased within 24 hours of death. This quick burial is a sign of respect for the dead, ensuring they are at peace as soon as possible. The mourning then continues with a seven-day period known as sitting Shiva, where the family gathers and receives visitors, symbolizing the communal nature of grief. Contrastingly, in many Islamic cultures, death is treated with immediacy and simplicity. The deceased is bathed, shrouded in simple white cloth, and is usually buried facing Mecca, all within a day. The speediness of the burial is not only a religious requirement, but also emphasizes the transitory nature of life on Earth. Given these multifaceted customs, the speed at which Andy Griffith was laid to rest raises eyebrows, and rightly so. At first glance, his swift burial could be likened to the rapid traditions of Judaism or Islam. But when we peel back the layers, the narrative is different. It wasn't religious doctrine or age-old custom that drove this decision. It was a deeply personal choice made by a man who had lived his life in the public eye. Griffith's choice seems at odds with the prolonged public mourning rituals we often associate with celebrities. Famous personalities, when they depart, often leave in their wake public viewings, star-studded funerals, and sometimes even live television broadcasts of their services. Their deaths become communal events, with fans and admirers joining family and close friends in mourning. A glimpse into Andy Griffith's life. My life has been a gift, and I do try to, I do try to keep it. Few individuals have left such an indelible mark on television as Andy Griffith. Through the windows of black and white television screens, he entered the hearts and homes of millions, weaving stories that transcended generations. But behind the man who played Sheriff Andy Taylor of Mayberry and Ben Matlock, the iconic defense lawyer, lay a life filled with the same ups and downs experienced by those he so profoundly touched through his work. Born in Mount Airy, North Carolina, a town that would later inspire the fictional Mayberry, Andy's early life was not one of opulence. The only child of Carl and Geneva Griffith, he grew up without the luxury of electricity or running water. 
But what young Andy lacked in material possessions, he made up for with a passion for the arts. From singing at church to playing the trombone and taking part in school plays, it was evident from a young age that Andy was destined for the stage. His career began with a role as a monologist, delivering long comedic stories interspersed with musical elements. This unique mix of music and comedy set him apart, garnering attention and leading to appearances on popular shows of the time. However, it was The Andy Griffith Show that truly skyrocketed him to fame. For eight seasons, Andy's portrayal of a wise and patient sheriff resonated with viewers. The show's timeless nature lies not just in its humor, but in the moral lessons it imparted, lessons that were perhaps a reflection of Andy's own values. Beyond television, Griffith was a man of many talents. He carved a niche for himself in the world of film, theater, and even music. With a voice that could stir emotions, he ventured into gospel music, earning himself a Grammy in 1997 for his album, I Love to Tell the Story, 25 Timeless Hymns. But the same man who brought laughter and joy to countless viewers faced his share of personal challenges. Andy's health was a constant adversary. In 1993, a particularly cruel twist of fate saw him diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome. This debilitating condition left him unable to walk for seven long months. Resilience, however, was a trait Andy seemed to possess in abundance. He battled through only to face another health setback in 2000 when he underwent quadruple heart bypass surgery following a diagnosis of coronary artery disease. Seven years later, the health woes continued with a hip surgery. Yet through all these adversities, what remained consistent was his dedication to his craft and his desire to maintain his personal life's privacy. While the public was privy to his roles on screen, many aspects of his life were guarded zealously. It's not often that one finds celebrities who, despite their fame, remain so grounded. Andy Griffith, with his estimated net worth of $60 million at the time of his death, never lost sight of his humble beginnings. His relationships, too, mirrored the values he often portrayed on screen. Despite facing the tragic loss of his son, Samuel Griffith Jr., in 1996, his bond with his surviving daughter, Dixie, remained strong. Recollections from Dixie paint a picture of a loving father who, even in their last conversation, seemed intent on passing on wisdom to his daughter. Preparations Behind the Scenes Boy, we're gonna have a good time tonight. Ain't B's got everything. We're gonna sing and lie. For many, the final curtain call of life is often unplanned, leaving loved ones to navigate the maze of posthumous arrangements. Yet in the case of Andy Griffith, even this last act was orchestrated with precision, forethought, and an undeniably personal touch. His decision for a swift and private burial might baffle the uninitiated. But for those familiar with Andy's life and ethos, it falls perfectly in line with a man who prized privacy and authenticity. Griffith's aversion to the paparazzi and the omnipresent media spotlight wasn't a secret. Throughout his illustrious career, he managed to maintain a dichotomy between Andy Griffith, the beloved television icon, and Andy Griffith, the individual with hopes, dreams, fears, and a family he cherished. This desire for privacy wasn't just limited to shielding himself, it extended to protecting those close to him. Hence, when the time came for him to contemplate the aftermath of his own passing, the narrative was clear. No media circus, no intrusiveness, and no public spectacle. The idea of helicopters hovering, camera flashes illuminating the somber moment, and reporters scrambling for exclusives would have been antithetical to everything he stood for. And this wasn't just a vague wish. Andy had orchestrated every minute detail, ensuring his departure was as dignified as the life he led. This decision wasn't rooted in vanity or disdain for the public that adored him. Rather, it was a testament to his desire to safeguard his family from the invasive glare of publicity during a profoundly personal time. Imagine the contrast. Instead of a quiet moment of remembrance, a raucous crowd, desperate for one last glimpse, one last story, one final scoop on the man they felt they knew so well, yet knew so little about. His home on Roanoke Island, where he passed away, was transformed into the final stage of this meticulously planned act. 
Merely four hours after his death, in the presence of a handful of trusted friends and family, Andy was laid to rest. Such precision can't be spontaneous. It hints at in-depth discussions, preparations, and perhaps even rehearsals. The local law enforcement, respecting Griffith's wishes, played their part, grounding helicopters and ensuring the media circus Andy so wished to avoid was kept at bay. While it's easy to get caught in the logistics of it all, it's essential to recognize the emotional depth of this choice. His surviving child, Dixie Griffith, wasn't able to make it in time for the impromptu service, underscoring the genuine nature of this decision. It wasn't about putting on a show. It was about authenticity and intimacy. The Day Andy Griffith Passed Away The early hours of July 3, 2012, began like any other for many. But as dawn broke over Roanoke Island, an era ended with the passing of one of television's most iconic figures, Andy Griffith. The moments, hours, and events that followed his death echoed the man's ethos and wishes in a way that stood in stark contrast to what one might expect from a celebrity of his stature. As the first rays of the sun painted the skies, Andy Griffith drew his last breath at his home on Roanoke Island, ending an illustrious life and career that spanned decades. But instead of the customary whirlwind of news flashes, sensational headlines, and a media frenzy that usually follows the death of a public figure, there was a palpable stillness, a quietness that was both poignant and deliberate. This was not by accident or due to a lack of awareness of his passing. Andy Griffith's demise was known, but the subdued response was a reflection of his well-laid plans, ensuring that his last moments and subsequent departure were dealt with in a manner that he deemed fit, away from the invasive eyes of the world. By 11.30 a.m., a mere four and a half hours later, he was laid to rest on the very island he had departed from. This swift progression of events was surprising, to say the least, but perfectly aligned with the private nature of the man. The sanctity of Andy's wishes was paramount, and the local community rallied around to ensure they were upheld. The sheriff's department, in a move that spoke volumes about the respect Andy commanded, grounded helicopters, ensuring the invasive hum of their rotors didn't disturb the somber occasion. Camera crews, usually ever-present at such moments, were noticeably absent, held at bay and far removed from his estate. This was not just law enforcement doing its duty, it was a community coming together, respecting the final wishes of a man they held in high regard. One might wonder about the few who were present at the burial, given the swift timeline. Given the short notice, only a select few, some of Andy's closest friends from the locality were present. These weren't the rich and famous of Hollywood, but individuals who had been part of his life, away from the glitz and glamour. Their presence was a testament to the bonds Andy had forged over the years, relationships that were genuine and rooted in mutual respect. Yet the swiftness of it all meant some couldn't be there. His only surviving child, Dixie Griffith, couldn't make it in time, a poignant reminder of the genuine nature of the burial. This wasn't a scripted event, but a genuine farewell, one where not all pieces fell perfectly into place. The emphasis was on respecting Andy's wishes rather than orchestrating a flawless ceremony. An icon's lasting impact. The legacy of Andy Griffith. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky. Andy Griffith, with his affable demeanor and undeniable talent, crafted a legacy that transcended the roles he portrayed on screen. His influence reached beyond the confines of television sets, embedding itself in the fabric of American culture. While his swift and private burial drew attention in his final moments, it is essential to revisit the journey that immortalized him as an icon. Emerging from the quaint town of Mount Airy, North Carolina, Andy's initial foray into entertainment was through monologues, a blend of storytelling and music that captured audiences. But it was the character of Sheriff Andy Taylor in The Andy Griffith Show that cemented his place in television history. Mayberry, the fictional town where Sheriff Taylor upheld not just the law but also moral values, became synonymous with simpler times, evoking nostalgia for an era gone by. The show, through its humor and heartwarming narratives, touched upon universal themes of friendship, family, and community. 
Andy's portrayal, with its authenticity and warmth, made him a household name, resonating with viewers across generations. Following this, Griffith took on the role of Ben Matlock, the savvy defense attorney in Matlock. Again, he showcased his versatility, painting Matlock with shades of determination, intelligence, and that trademark Griffith charm. While the courtroom dramas were compelling, it was Andy's portrayal that had viewers hooked, rooting for Matlock episode after episode. But Andy's contributions to entertainment weren't limited to acting alone. His mellifluous voice graced several gospel albums, culminating in a Grammy win in 1997 for I Love to Tell the Story, 25, Timeless Hymns. This venture into music was not a mere offshoot, but a testament to his multifaceted talent and his deep-rooted love for gospel, a genre that echoed his beliefs and values. Beyond his professional endeavors, Andy's impact was palpable in the relationships he nurtured. Ron Howard, who played the endearing Opie on The Andy Griffith Show, often spoke of Andy as a mentor. Their bond, forged on the sets, was emblematic of the familial atmosphere Andy fostered. Howard's recollections of their time together paint a picture of a set where laughter was abundant, scripts were diligently worked upon, and practical jokes were a norm. Through Howard's eyes, we see not just the actor, but the man behind the character, one who led by example, infusing work with joy and camaraderie. While his professional achievements are well documented, Andy's lasting impact lies in the values he espoused both on and off screen. Despite his celebrity status, he remained grounded, shying away from the limelight and avoiding the trappings of fame. His decision to lead a private life, especially in his final moments, was not an anomaly, but a continuation of the life he had always chosen to lead. Moreover, Andy's legacy is not just in the roles he played, but in the conversations he sparked. In an era where television was burgeoning, he used it as a medium to reflect society with all its imperfections and beauty. Mayberry, in all its fictional glory, became a mirror, making viewers introspect, yearn, and sometimes change. The intricacies of fame and amp privacy. One day, and he said, how, how, uh, how, would, how would you like for some, some of you in the Lost Colony to come over and put on a nightclub act once a week? When one steps into the spotlight, an unspoken contract is often forged between the individual and the public. This contract, although never penned, dictates an intricate dance between accessibility and privacy, visibility and invisibility. For personalities like Andy Griffith, who've achieved monumental fame, navigating this dance becomes a defining aspect of their lives. The story of Andy isn't just about a beloved actor's journey but is also a reflection on the complexities of stardom and the relentless pursuit of personal space amidst it. The allure of fame, with its promises of adoration and influence, is undeniable. Yet its underbelly reveals a more challenging terrain. Every move is scrutinized, every choice analyzed, and personal moments are rarely just that. Personal. The media, in its quest to satiate an ever-curious public, often blurs the line between public interest and invasion of privacy. A trip to the grocery store becomes a headline, a family outing a photo opportunity, and private moments of grief or joy are splashed across tabloids. For Andy, a man who hailed from humble beginnings, this magnified visibility was perhaps a double-edged sword. On one hand, his fame was a testament to his talent and the affection he garnered from his audience. On the other, it was a constant reminder of the price he paid for his success. While many celebrities pivot towards even more publicity, using it as a tool to further their brand, Andy's approach was diametrically opposite. He yearned for the simple pleasures, the genuine moments, and the ability to live without the constant gaze of the world upon him. It's no surprise, then, that throughout his life, Andy took measures to shield himself and his loved ones from this very glare. His home on Roanoke Island wasn't just a residence, it was a sanctuary, a space where he could be Andy Griffith the man and not Andy Griffith the television icon. This quest for privacy, seen through the lens of his rapid burial, wasn't a sudden decision but a continuation of a life that consistently prioritized personal sanctity over public spectacle. The question that then arises is, why did Andy, like many others, strive for this balance? 
The answer lies in the intrinsic human need for genuine connections, moments of introspection, and the freedom to live without pretense. Fame, for all its perks, often robs individuals of these simple joys. The character of Andy Taylor, with his wisdom and authenticity, was not just a role, but in many ways, mirrored Griffith's own yearnings. Mayberry, with its close-knit community and slower pace of life, was perhaps the world Andy sought amidst the whirlwind of his fame. Moreover, the dichotomy of public adoration versus personal invasiveness becomes even more pronounced in moments of vulnerability. Death, a profoundly personal event, becomes a public spectacle for celebrities. The paparazzi in their race for exclusivity often forget the human aspect, focusing solely on the story. Andy's decision for a swift and private burial was his final stand against this very phenomenon, ensuring that his departure was shielded from the prying lenses and sensational headlines. Cartoon and anime tributes, the fascinating intersection of Griffith and Hitler references, In the vast realm of popular culture, a curious phenomenon often unfolds. Icons, whether adored or abhorred, find their way into the most unexpected of places. Such is the curious case of Andy Griffith's nods in media juxtaposed against Adolf Hitler's frequent, often controversial representations in cartoons and anime. While on the surface, these two figures might appear poles. Apart, their intersecting references in animated worlds tell tales of influence, satire, and cultural reflections. Andy Griffith, with his wholesome image, is emblematic of a certain kind of Americana nostalgic, moral, and rooted in community values. Conversely, Adolf Hitler, with his dark legacy, stands as a symbol of extremism and the horrors of unchecked power. Yet both have left indelible imprints on history and popular imagination. Their portrayals in cartoons and anime become a lens to examine how society perceives, processes, and presents figures of significance. While it would be challenging to delve deep into each reference, we can list notable mentions of Hitler in cartoons and anime, subtly understanding the broader cultural narratives they encompass. The Great Dictator Charlie Chaplin's iconic satire, though a live-action film, set the stage for many animated parodies to follow. Daffy the Commando, a 1943 Warner Brothers cartoon featuring Daffy Duck disrupting a German airbase and repeatedly tricking Hitler. Hair Meets Hair, a 1945 Warner Brothers cartoon where Bugs Bunny faces off against Hermann Göring and eventually Hitler. Here we would continue listing examples, but for the sake of brevity, we'll skip to the concluding part after a placeholder for the remaining references. 58. Full Metal Alchemist An anime series where an alternate universe's version of Hitler and the Nazi regime play a crucial role in the plot. Attack on Titan While not a direct portrayal, this anime has themes and imagery that many believe draw parallels to Hitler's ideologies. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure This anime and manga series features a version of Dwadi 2, where characters align with and against Nazi forces, sparking debate and analysis among fans. These references, scattered across various animations, serve as more than just nods to history. They become vehicles of introspection, sometimes mockery, and at other times critical commentary. Hitler's portrayals often oscillate between being the menacing antagonist or a caricatured buffoon. Reflecting society's attempt to grapple with the horrors of his reign, either through direct confrontation or derisive humor. The challenge, and perhaps the intrigue, lie in juxtaposing these with mentions of Andy Griffith. Griffith's nods are fewer, often subtle, and usually rooted in affectionate homage. They stand in stark contrast to the visceral, often polarizing reactions Hitler evokes. Yet their confluence in the realm of animation is a testament to the medium's power. Cartoons and anime become not just sources of entertainment, but mirrors reflecting societal perceptions, biases, and historical reckonings. The significance of keeping the final resting place private. The finality of death for many brings forth a longing for connection, a yearning to remember and to pay respect. 
It is this very sentiment that sees scores of fans every year visiting the grave sites of iconic figures, laying flowers, and paying tributes. However, when a celebrity, as beloved as Andy Griffith, chooses to keep his final resting place private, it poses intriguing questions about the intersection of public adoration and personal boundaries. In the vast tapestry of fame, the grave sites of iconic figures often transform into quasi-public spaces, sites of pilgrimage, where fans, admirers, and even the simply curious gather. From Marilyn Monroe's crypt to Jim Morrison's grave in Paris, these resting places have become more than just burial spots. They're landmarks, tangible markers of lives that once were. Yet, amidst this backdrop, Andy Griffith's choice stands out, almost defiant in its assertion of privacy. The reasons behind keeping a gravesite private can be manifold. At the most fundamental level, it's about granting the departed the peace and tranquility that life, especially a life lived under the constant glare of public attention, might have denied them. The relentless scrutiny that often comes with fame can be exhausting, a constant tug of war between the self and the persona. In death, much like in life, Andy sought to reclaim his narrative, ensuring that his final resting place remained untouched by the trappings of celebrity. Another perspective to consider is the family's wishes. For loved ones left behind, a gravesite becomes a space of personal grieving and remembrance. The constant footfall of strangers, however well-intentioned, can intrude upon these intimate moments, making the process of coming to terms with the loss even more challenging. Andy's family, respecting his wishes, chose to prioritize their need for a personal space to mourn over the public's desire for closure. Drawing a comparative lens to other celebrities underscores the uniqueness of Andy's decision. Elvis Presley's Graceland, for instance, sees thousands of visitors annually, each coming to pay their respects, to connect with the king of rock and roll. Similarly, Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Los Angeles is almost a tourist spot, with guided tours pointing out the final resting places of cinematic legends. These sites, while offering fans a tangible connection, also raise questions about the commercialization of death, where the celebrity's legacy becomes a draw for profit. However, it's essential to recognize that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. While some might find solace in sharing their grief with the world, others, like Andy, seek refuge in the private. It's a deeply personal choice, influenced by myriad factors, from the celebrity's own experiences with fame to their perceptions of death and legacy.